Living Room Logic. Welcome back to another episode of Living Room Logic. And this week we're going to be talking to a NASA researcher, which is going to be absolutely exciting. So to be honest, I think I just want to fly into it. Dr. Quiveroon, do you want to just briefly introduce yourself and what you do? Yes, well, thank you very much for having me. I am a NASA scientist. At the minute, I'm working at NASA Ames in California, where I am looking at planets outside of our solar system. So these planets are called exoplanets. They're very, very far away, so we can't actually go there and study them. Uh, You can't send probes there or rockets there the way you could things in our solar system. So the way we try to understand these planets is through looking at the telescopes, looking at the data received from the telescopes and trying to understand this data. So that's where I come in. I'm a mathematician, so I spend a lot of my time making models for this data, for the for how a planet might look to the telescope. And that's that's what I've been doing for the last two and a half years since that's, I finished my PhD. That's crazy. And it's such a impressive thing to be doing immediately after a PhD to just immediately <laughs> jump into like some of the biggest things on Earth. And it has been recognized, to be fair, because what caught my eye looking around was that you were part of the Forbes 30 under 30. <laughs> I'm sure it's a little weird even for you to kind of think about because it's just it's such a phenomenal and absolutely deserved achievement. And like, how was that experience when that came <laughs> <laughs> it definitely was because they didn't they didn't tell us until the list was published. So the day I found out was the day everyone found out. So I sort of woke up to like there was a lot happening on LinkedIn, and I, so I was a bit what's going on here. And I checked all of that before I even checked my own email. So by the time I found out, <laughs> it had sort of spread a bit further afield. So it was definitely it was definitely a bit of a surprise and you know haven't it hasn't quite sunk in although i'm heading off i'm heading in a couple of weeks hopefully heading to detroit for a summit with some of the other 30 under 30 listers so i'd say that might hopefully be when it sinks in a wee bit when i get to be a part of something like that it's such a huge recognition of clearly so much hard work and like it's more recognition of achievement it's not achievement it's look at everything (laughs) this all this amazing cool stuff you've done like immediately working at nasa following your phd must be wild and out of just was that always the goal were you always thinking right i'm going to make my way to nasa eventually (laughs) and that you're so interested in space but you're you're a mathematician so Mm -hmm. Was your interest always in space or was it somewhere else initially? Initially, I really had no idea. I was just doing maths because so I always loved space and space is always something that fascinated me ever since I was a child. But I didn't know I could do anything with it. I sort of when I was growing up, I knew about NASA, but I understood that you had to be an American citizen to work for NASA. So I'd sort of ruled that out from a young age. And I didn't know enough about any of the sort of European space initiatives that were taking place closer to home. So it was something I was always like, that's really cool, but not really an option for me. But I just kept studying maths because I love math. And the further through I got my maths education and I started doing my PhD. And then I realized that I, I could work there as a research scientist and I could apply a lot of the mathematical modeling techniques that I had I'd picked up along the way were applicable to a whole range of different scientific disciplines, not just space, but space being the one that interested me the most. So it really wasn't actually until I was doing my PhD that I started to seek out those opportunities and, and realize that they were options. So I got I got quite lucky in the end, really finding that position so soon after the PhD and being able to take my maths and apply it. And that was really down to my supervisor, Professor Mark Marley. He really took on board my skills and sort of the different perspective I would bring as a mathematician and was able to bring me on board to a team of astrophysicists. So a bit of a switch. God, but like as much as that might be a few things coming together, it's still so earned. You know, (laughs) there's so much hard work that goes in long before you (laughs) get lucky in this scenario. You know what I mean? (laughs) So this was all going on. You you just had a a passion for maths and you went to Trinity, did you? Mm -hmm. maths? I did my undergrad at Trinity, yeah. And then my PhD was at the University of Oxford. As you do. (laughs) Was that the plan? Were were you always think, were were you just thinking to do a PhD or were you just, or was there something that caught your eye in Oxford? No, I was, when I was coming to the end of my bachelor's, the end of my undergrad, I just wasn't really finished learning maths. Our undergrad, the Trinity undergrad was quite broad. We got a lot of, a little bit of a lot of subjects would be the way to put it. Kind of got to touch on a lot of different maths. 
so when I was coming out of it I still just felt like there was more I could do I could I could hone in on something a bit deeper which is why then I chose to do a PhD and the program at Oxford was quite unique it was called industrially focused mathematical modeling so it was very applied all of the projects there was 13 in my cohort all of our PhD projects were sponsored by companies with real world industrial problems that we were tasked with solving using maths, all while trying to write up a mathematical thesis. So there's always a bit of a balance between trying to produce something the company wants and trying to write something that will get you a PhD. So that it was quite a unique opportunity and it was a great way to take the maths and apply it in a way that was actually benefiting a company or benefiting people and, and not just being quite so abstract, which people often think maths can be abstract or isn't useful or those sort of things. So it was it was a great way to really use maths for for good. Yeah, and I can absolutely imagine. Like my own perception of a lot of mathematics is, as you're constantly figuring things out, you you can't be certain where exactly it can always be applied. But then suddenly it is applied, and suddenly uh-huh. it is very useful. And like a uh, they they made a there, there's always that conversation around like things that NASA would be doing and things in the sixties and seventies, and especially in that crossover between like mathematics and engineering, where when you're trying to solve one problem. It may take you a thousand tries to get it right, but in the process, you'll solve 990 yeah. <laughs> problems just just by by accident. Someone will say, oh, actually, that thing we did, that will be useful here. Exactly. And I feel like maths is very much like that. Mm-hmm. So you were in Oxford and you were doing your PhD, and I'm so excited for you to tell me how wrong I am. But what I was... <laughs> What I picked up on from briefly looking at your thesis, which was, <laughs> which was a lot, <laughs> it was, it was a lot for my poor biologist's mind. It, it was an awful, uh, an awful lot. Though the introduction and abstract was very lovelily written for someone like me, so thank you very much. <laughs> but what I was getting was that a lot of what you were doing was predicting how particles move. And predicting how they move in different environments and under different stresses and under different things, which in my head is quite a chaotic thing to be trying to predict, whether you're talking about food in a blender or if you're talking about the formation of planets in the universe. There's an awful lot of factors, my gosh, to actually bring into this. Could you tell me more about specifically what you were doing in your PhD? And then we'll make the dance over to how that then comes into what you're doing at NASA, at least. Yeah. So you're close with the particles. So, <laughs> the, the, well, the blender particles, absolutely right. I did a short project with a blender company where we tried to understand how a blade would chop food in a, in a blender to make a smooth smoothie and how you could optimize that whole mechanism to try and get the smoothest smoothie possible without having the loudest blender possible or a blender that uses all the energy. That was a lot more moving particles. Whereas my PhD, it had a particulate component. It was looking at furnaces of carbon particles, of you know bits of coal. But I didn't focus so much on them moving, which would have been a part of the problem, but it's just quite a big problem. So the problem that I, the bit that I honed in on was how these particles conducted electricity. So The way a furnace works, a metallurgical furnace, it'll be a big vessel and you fill it full of stuff. And then you've got an electrode at the top and an electrode at the bottom, typically. And what will happen is they'll pass a current between those two electrodes. The current will conduct through whatever material you've got in the furnace and in doing so will manipulate that material in some way. So the the particular furnace I was looking at was called a calciner. The material inside it was particulate carbon, so bits of coal. And as the current passed through that coal, it heated up. And in particular, it heated up at its little contact points where all of the particles touched each other. And you get quite a lot of heating in particular at those small points. And as the carbon heats up, the material properties of it start to change and it starts to resemble something a bit more like graphite, which is more desirable within the metallurgy industry. They want to get something like graphite because it's very conductive and and it's a good material to have. So the issue, though, for the company was they have these big furnaces and they know if they put carbon in it and they turn it on, they'll get something out the bottom. But they just didn't know exactly what happened inside because they were they got very hot. They got over a thousand degrees Celsius they could reach. And you can't really just, you know, stick a spade in there and take out a little sample. Mm -hmm. So they 
relied on models and simulations to try and understand how that current exactly was heating the material and what that heating was doing to the particles. So that's where the, the math sort of came in to try and understand that. And then the biggest challenge with that was these furnaces are huge, but the particles are tiny. So when you're trying to do mathematical models, you have these vast discrepancies in the two scales you're considering. You have to apply some, some tricks to get something that's sort of computationally tractable. So I think you can, you can solve on a computer in a reasonable length of time. So that's, that's where I came in. So it's pretty necessary as well when you're looking at this, that since it's within this closed system, it's in this system that you can't get. It's in this place that you can't check. You really depend on predicting what's going on. Like you're, exactly. you're almost completely dependent on it because mm -hmm. you can't get to it. So I can see how that would be very, very useful for looking inside of an environment that is so close, but you can't touch it as well as maybe in what you're doing now, which is an environment that is so far that you can't yeah. <laughs> always look at exactly what's going on. So it makes a lot of sense like that, how there is a crossover. And, and how there is the skill that you have is that you can see things that we can't look at. You can predict things that we can't look at. And is that, again, is that roughly along the right lines of, of what's going on? Yeah, here? 100%. You've got something that you might not be able to physically touch and put your hands on will still be underpinned by some sort of mathematical equation. There's always a way that you can take something physical and put it on paper in the form of equations of physics principles of all those things so if you can break a problem down into those into those components you can do a lot with just the math and you can really understand quite complex processes by just looking at at the math that underpins it and in that so i'm assuming with these models that you're making you can kind of train them and tune them based off of lots and lots of results, which I'm sure with a furnace or, and things like that, you might be able to see the outcome because mm -hmm. it's, let's say, for example, it's a shorter process than the formation of exoplanets, <laughs> for example. So I'm imagining with the furnace, you could kind of fine tune it and you could say, oh, we thought this would happen, but this would happen. Let's mm -hmm. fill in the next thing, which brings us next to NASA, which I can imagine is that's something you don't have the luxury of having uh -huh. the before and after. You just have what's in front of you. Mm -hmm. How do you even approach that? That sounds, I'm assuming that's a big problem. Is it a big problem? It's a challenge. So the planets that we're looking at, you know, the discovery of exoplanets is just accelerating. With the more telescopes we put up there, especially now with the James Webb telescope, there's just... We're actually getting more data than we have models for. So previously, we wouldn't have really had, maybe the models wouldn't have been up to scratch. And they're, they're really still not quite up to scratch due to the limitations we have in really understanding how these planets behave. But the way we would try and check a model and check what we're doing is to compare it with this data that we're getting from planets. So the more that we're getting back from the telescopes, the more refined these models are becoming the bigger issue, aside from just validating your models, the bigger issue is just how complex these environments are and our limited understanding really of how they behave. Because we only really have Earth as a reference point. You know, if we look at, I look a lot at clouds around planets. So the only cloud we know are water clouds. But mm. clouds on other planets could be made of anything. They could be made of iron. They could be made of sulfur. They could be made of, you know, there's planets that, apparently have clouds made of carbon and it rains diamonds. So you have all of these different kinds of physics that we're really just having a go at and, and saying, well, we think this is how this would behave. And based on the chemical properties of this element, we'd imagine clouds are like this. There's a lot of uncertainty in the models that we're creating. So you kind of have to think about that. You don't want to be too, you don't really want to delve down too deep into something that could be completely wrong. So it's sort of a balance between getting that physics and getting the the technical components in there and all of those intricacies and everything that we know should be happening on a planet, but also balancing it with the, well, how much of this is uncertain? How much of this is just a guess? Because you need to kind of have a good balance between 
detail and your limitations. So a lot of the models that we're making will simplify them quite a lot and, you know, focus on some components of atmosphere. So, for example, when you think about how a cloud forms, you, know, you have these little particles and they'll start to condense. The you know, vapor will condense into, in our case, water, but in, on the planets could be anything. And these things start to coagulate and they get bigger and they grow and they move and they do all sorts of things. Trying to put all of that into one model just becomes extremely difficult. So we might just strip that down and say, well, let's just think about the condensation part. Let's just focus on that element and see what we come up with and see how good a model is with just this one factor. How good is it at predicting? If it's not great, it probably won't be because there's not very much. You start to add in some more bits. So it's kind of a process. Of, so kind of what you said, uh, let's let's go back and forth. This did well, this didn't. You're still doing the same thing. So you always start with something simple and try and build in more complex components. And as our database gets bigger, which it is, we'll be able to build in more and more and hopefully get get good models in the end. But so it's an exciting process because, you know, you're really you've got the freedom to kind of think outside the box and think, will this be a good addition or maybe we could take that thing out and yeah. Yeah, like forget the freedom to think outside the box. There's the demand. You have to completely throw the toys out of the pram and say every assumption, every instinct you have is probably not how it works. Because, uh-huh. you know, like we'd be focusing so many of our instincts on just things going on on Earth. And you're looking at something alien, like yeah. literally something so outside of it that we have to just bring it back and go oh what if it does rain sulfur (laughs) and what if that's mixing with other things going on and pulling exactly Mm -hmm. and I can only imagine the headaches that come across with that all of the time when you're looking at that would would you be looking so so we were using like clouds for for example but would you be looking at clouds like things that are going on on exoplanets or would you primarily or would you also be looking at things like the formation of exoplanets as well? I'm primarily looking at exoplanets that exist so Mm. the clouds the clouds that are forming and how they impact the the spectra that we get back from a planet so what, what clouds why I'm most interested in clouds is that they can be very problematic when you look at a planet so if you point a telescope out in space and it's getting data back from these planets the telescope is detecting light from the planet that's how the telescope works and then you'll break that light down into what we call the spectra which is basically it's like a rainbow you split it up into its different wavelengths and you look at how much light the intensity of light at every wavelength so what you'll get is this sort of graph which is with lots of peaks and troughs and what we call atmospheric features and those features will tell you a bit about if there's oxygen if there's carbon what what sort of elements are in that planet or in that atmosphere to have scattered the light in the way that the telescope detected it so the problem with clouds is that sometimes clouds can just mask the atmosphere completely so with the light coming off the planet they're like reflected off the planet or whatever into the telescope isn't actually capturing all of those those features because the the clouds are hiding them so you want to understand clouds and you want to try and understand how they how they form and how thick they are and different things about them to be able to factor those into your models. So that when you look at a spectra that maybe has some damped features or things that maybe don't look quite right, you could attribute that potentially to a cloud. That's something I didn't even think about now because I, I can imagine that because like I know there was that day one when all of the images came back from James Webb, there was like all of these amazing things. And then there was a spectra from an exoplanet. Mm. That it kind of <laughs> it kind of got left to the side a little bit. But one thing I certainly mm-hmm. never considered was is that when you're looking at the atmosphere and stuff, the atmosphere and what you're looking at isn't uniform. It isn't no. just equal all around. And th- these damn clouds would be... <laughs> leaving you with some really dense areas where it's it just extremely concentrated and how you account for that <laughs> <laughs> it is <laughs> <laughs> I can't even. Oh yeah, we just looked at this this damn planet going around a star millions of light years away. And, oh, why is your data bad? It was raining. You know, like how? Do you, yeah. how do you know? We happened to point it at a time that there was just a cloud and trying to like, oh, 
I don't even know how you go, how you approach that because yeah. it's so complicated. And I suppose that's exactly what you're doing. It's to actually bring that in. And you mentioned a phrase there, which I didn't quite get, but you said like, if you looking at the spectra and you see a dampening effect mm-hmm. or, or something like that, did you mention? And would that be like something you were expecting is there, but which is blocked? And would that be something that would occur because of a cloud, for example? Yes. So for example, if you had, say you were looking at a, an atmosphere that had oxygen, you would expect there to be peaks in that spectra at particular wavelengths and the physicists and the chemists will have a better idea of exactly what wavelengths those peaks occur at but if there had been a cloud sort of masking the atmosphere those peaks you still might get a glimpse of them if if you know the the light penetrated through the cloud enough and came back to the telescope you might get what we call a dampened feature which is just it's just not as sharp or not as prominent as it should be so you often would see dampening of features if there was a cloud so they're just not as prominent as you would think but sometimes if the cloud's thick enough you don't get any features at all that's when you're in big trouble and all of this now all of this work digging into exactly what the huge benefit of looking at these clouds are is it trying to see what does an average planet in the universe look like as opposed to what we are I'm not going to throw you under the bus and be like, are there aliens, Dr. <laughs> Rooney? Are there? <laughs> Even though that, I suppose there is a little bit of, there's always, I think, maybe maybe it's just a, a part of humanity to think that human, that human life and life here is so special and unique because we haven't seen it elsewhere, but is genuinely a part of what you're doing, seeing if you look across the planets around all of the stars in the Milky Way and stuff like that, what does the typical rocky planet look like? And then trying to compare that to what we're like. Is there a little bit of that going on? It's not even so much what does a typical planet look like. It is about discovering what's the most prevalent planet, what, what type of planets form most often, what kind of planets form around different stars. One thing that still sort of is in question and is interesting in scientists is how solar systems form or you know planetary systems form and their positions and having a look at different planetary systems gives us insight into this you know we we have our own solar system but lots of other stars will have a number of planets orbiting them but primarily it's just to discover what's out there and get a greater understanding of the universe how it formed in general but yeah, search for life, try and see, you know, we're, we're, you're always looking for water, liquid water, different things that we understand to be components of life or necessary for life to exist. Now, this is life as we know it. There could always be a different form of life that we haven't seen yet, that we don't understand yet, that could exist without liquid water. But as far as we're concerned, you need certain things in order for life to exist. So you always, there'll be the odd headline that'll say, you know, super earth discovered or Earth-like planet discovers most potential for harboring life, things like that. That is an interest of scientists is can we find something that's like Earth? What's the closest planet out there to Earth? Because that could be somewhere that there could be another form of life. That's so interesting. It's so interesting that that's actually happening. <laughs> as, opposed to, <laughs> as opposed to the tinfoil hat I have on. It is wonderful and it's so interesting. And I can imagine there would also be a a lot of interest in the distribution of different elements in the universe and trying to like see, maybe identifying, wow, there is a lot of element X on this planet. How mm-hmm. did that happen? That's yeah. unusual. And is there a lot of that going on as well, where you just there see is. outliers and it leads to obviously more questions and you t- uh-huh. people have to actually answer, how did that happen? Yeah, exactly. And there'll be discoveries of planets that are bigger than they should be orbiting a star closer than they should be or vice versa. Stars that are very, or planets that are huge and really bright that are very far away from their sun or their star and so there's still, as we discover more planets and as they're getting analyzed and, and we get better data, scientists are just discovering more and more things that are making them change the way they understood the universe to operate and for planets to behave. And, you know, there's so many different things that goes in, you know, you're observing a planet at a moment in time, which is really like years and years and years ago. By the time it reaches our telescopes, we're looking at how it 
appeared many years in the past. So you're still, you're, you're kind of learning about something that's probably not like that anymore. And then many things can happen. What I've always loved about it is that it's just so vast. You know, there's so much to discover and there's so many different components of it that are important. You've got the chemistry, you've got the physics, you've got all of the unknowns in terms of dark matter. And, and there's just, if anybody's curious in any way, there's something in space that would, would fascinate them and they could work on and they could they could discover. Because it's sometimes, you know, we've got Google, we've got, there's so many things that you just get the answer for instantly now. It's very, you don't spend a lot of time thinking and trying to work things out, but when it comes to space, you do, because there's so much we don't know. So I, I just think it's such a great way to, to really explore science, to think through difficult problems, to think outside the box and to be curious. Yeah, no, I really identify with that. And uh, like you were giving me very like when I was younger, I had the exact same thought where it was just that sheer curiosity. I just knew I liked science and that I was just my top two things on the seat. The CAO was like astrophysics in uh -huh. Galway and then neuroscience in Cork. Because in, oh, uh. in my head, I was like, I just want to go somewhere where we don't know what's going on. And <laughs> yeah. I, I ended up not getting astrophysics and ending up in neuroscience. No, no, no. I didn't get neuroscience, but I, and I was getting astrophysics, but then I got in through like a access route and I was like, sweet, this is fantastic. <laughs> so, but when you're hitting that, it, it hits such a like, there's like the 18 year old, the guy who romanticized science long before his PhD started. And, <laughs> you know, yeah. and, and I'm just like, oh, that's so wonderful. And, and it's so true. And I adore that about space. And like you said, that vastness, that idea that it's so vast that so much is possible. And mm -hmm. the fact that you're actually working on a team that's observing some of these wild outliers and you're left just godsmacked of yeah. this doesn't make sense. And I'm sure that you would also face a problem sometimes where you would make a fantastic model. But the problem is the universe is so big that the fantastic models, 1% chance of something going wrong, you'll find it. Yeah. You'll find that time <laughs> that that happened and you'll have to make the decision of, does that mean the model is wrong? Probably it, it might not. It might be very, very good, except you have, it's just the universe is so big. You found that time, yeah. that time, something swung off into infinity. And it's just, it must be absolutely mind bending. <laughs> the, the next thing that, that comes to mind that I'm curious about is you said there was like a huge influx of data and there was more data than you had models. And where would you be getting a lot of your data from? Would it be from like, telescopes in space or telescopes on land or where, where would a lot of the data that you're feeding into your models be coming from? So the data that we work, so the models I'm currently developing are still very much in development. So I sort of am working on a very limited number of data sets that I think they were space telescopes. I want to say they were from tech. I'm not sure exactly which oh. telescope, but I'm pretty sure they were space telescopes. They are... <laughs> They're very much like the test case that I've just sort of systematically run for two years. And I, I suppose I've become a bit in the big picture. And I talk about the data and I talk about the planets. But then really my day to day is just sitting in front of my computer with a code trying to figure out why I've got this one peak where it shouldn't be. So you kind of forget at the end of the day, I'm always, I'm screaming at this data when really I'm not yeah. thinking about that it came from space. But isn't that the reality? It's, it's yeah. exactly what I was just saying of the like, I love, and, and it's so important to hold on to that romantic side. And, and like, yeah. I, I love what I'm doing. I love what I'm doing. Yeah. But, but, but I'm the same. I spend most of my time at my desk staring at a massive Excel sheet or MATLAB sheet or something like that, working on massive data sets. And it's so detached from that, even though it's so important, you know, yeah. you, you, you are working with real things. Like I'm working mm -hmm. with real biological data. You're working with a lot of real data of things that exist and the day-to-day -day moments of tap, 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 tap. Why is there an error? Fix the error. <laughs> tap, tap. Why is there a new? It is a separation in science. Mm -hmm. and I think since we speak so much about the romantic side of science, people often forget that they're just jobs. Yeah. <laughs> like, 
they don't televise everyone in the office just like, <laughs> or the two years of work that goes like it for example before a launch at launch day for anything everything looks like a movie and it's so exciting and everyone's so happy there was yeah. two years of pain before that you know there were <laughs> decades of people sitting in offices scratching their head and slowly losing hair you know yeah uh, <laughs> I think that's just such a huge huge part of of sites which I think people like forget an awful lot mm. it happens as well I, sorry I know I'm on a little ramble now but it does happen as well whenever someone in like biology for example or medicine would publish a new article and it could be purely based on data they would they would say a newspaper will come in and be like go in throw on a lab coat and, <laughs> yeah. and, and put something into a tube it's like these are people who haven't seen the inside of a lab in a decade you know and yeah. it's just it's just to feed the image that's in the public yeah. discourse of this is what it looks like and it's <laughs> to just, be a scientist I know if I ever get asked what's what's a day in the life <laughs> like, I don't know if you really want to know but a typical day in the life is like make a cup of tea sit at my desk do some coding have my lunch yeah. yeah I'm sure people have an image of, of you arguing with physicists in front of a blackboard going no it's like this <laughs> this is how it really should be <laughs> oh I can only imagine and that is a part of, that's something we didn't quite touch on is it st- I, I read before but you're the only mathematician on a team of physicists is that correct yes and how how does that play together like how does your role intermingle with their role for example on the team so My role initially, I was brought in to try and improve existing models. So there is my research team had had a model for clouds and a model for general radiative transfer. And both of these are relatively old and they had been previously written in Fortran and then converted to to Python. So the capabilities of the packages and and the different sort of numerical capabilities we have now with the programming language of Python these codes weren't really utilizing any of that yet because they they had been just transcribed essentially from this other programming language. So I was brought in to try and improve these models. Their main selling point was that they're very, very fast. So you can get results. So I spoke a bit earlier about the more detail you include and the more intricacies, these models become slow and they can become so slow that they're just not useful. So the models that I've been working on, are they're accurate but they're very quick. So they wanted to maintain that. They wanted to keep that sort of quickness, the efficiency of the models, but wanted a bit more flexibility of the models. You can, you know, have a few more parameters, be able to handle a more diverse environment that you're trying to model. So I was sort of relying on their physics and their sort of scientific guidance to say, this is the important components. This is what we need to capture. This is where we're limited. And then I was coming in with the maths, trying to be like, right, well, let's see if we can incorporate that in the model in this way. Or can we can we add this bit of detail, but keep the speed down in this way? So it's worked well. It has been challenging with the pandemic and with me primarily being in Ireland because there's an eight hour time difference. So when I'm relying on a physicist to tell me if this parameter should be 1.5 or 8, I'm waiting a long time. And then quite often by the time they've got a moment to get back to me, my working day is over. So it's been slow trying to make collaborative progress sometimes. But ultimately, the team I've worked with have been excellent. And they've let me work my own hours for a start, which is which was huge because if I had to work California hours, I would be a recluse even more so than we all were during the pandemic. So there's a lot of back and forth, a bit of here's the physics and then me coming back with, okay, I've done some maths. Is this something that you think works? And so it's been, I mean, it's been great. I've learned so much as well, which is kind of what I, I love to do. I love taking maths and applying it in areas that is maybe a bit new or it's not my specialty and kind of learning. I learned, I know so much about clouds <laughs> and about <laughs> rate of transfer things I never would have known otherwise. So it's been, it's been great. That's amazing. Yeah, no, that's so, so interesting just to see how how it all fits together. And yeah, it makes total sense that you're there to actually make the model good. And you you do have to lean on on other people to kind of get that importance factor in. But that's teamwork. That's how that that's how that goes, you know. Yeah. And I suppose, like you were saying there, you love that learning and all of that stuff. But like, what do you think is where do you think you, you'll go next? 
do you think like obviously obviously you're very happy where you are obviously this is all <laughs> going amazing but like I, I I've seen for example and I know you launched it a while ago but I saw the science communication project and you're doing loads of really good videos and stuff like that like communicating maths which is just a one and do you think you and are you going to keep that project going and do you think that like well first yeah we'll talk about that project first before we go into anything else that you you might be thinking about down the line it's mathematicals play on mathematical but ma- mathematical mathematicals so the initiative was set up by myself and another maths PhD student Jessica Williams we both did our PhDs together at Oxford and then we were sort of both motivated to do something to encourage and to showcase women in maths because I mean there's not enough women in maths but the women in maths that are there people just don't know them if you think about famous mathematicians or famous scientists in general it's always men that come to mind we think that that is pretty detrimental for getting more girls interested in science and and girls interested in math so that was sort of where the initiative stemmed from was this promotion of women and encouraging of girls to pursue careers in maths so we founded Mathematicals to try and combat this and we kind of we try and combat three things the first is we want to try and make maths fun because that's definitely something that I don't think it's world renowned for being the most fun subject at school a lot of people did not like maths and claim that they are no good at maths and we think that all just comes down to they never really connected with the subject in school which we understand we understand why that happened but we think that we can present maths in a way that's a bit more fun, a bit more accessible, and will hopefully engage not only kids, but just the general public. We want to get more girls interested in maths, and we want to showcase all the all the women in maths. So that's the sort of three things that we're trying to do. So we make videos, we, we try and share little mathematical quirks and curiosities and things that we think might spark people's interest. But ultimately, we are hoping to grow that and to actually reach out a bit more directly to girls to students to schools to teachers to anyone that we think could make an impact to try and get more girls in the maths and just make maths a bit more fun in general yeah and it's such a good initiative as well because especially for the cohort that your videos and stuff would be targeting people in schools that's where this kind of leaky pipe begins because i've heard stories as well of like all girls school where the school doesn't prioritize making sure that there's physics teachers and like honors maths teachers and multiple honors maths teachers to expand classes and applied maths as well because it's not typical but that's Mm -hmm. totally missing the point yeah and there is so much truth when you think about like famous physicists or mathematicians or things like that you think of men and so much of that must tie into where this leaky pipe is coming from. So I, I think yeah. that work that work that you're doing, just to just even to just have the exposure out there that girls could see it's it's happening. And like you're yeah. such a fantastic example working at NASA, doing all of this amazing work through what can only be called such a fascinating route you've taken here <laughs> to, to get where you are it is it, it is fascinating by default starting off where you're from and then going to trinity and then to oxford and into nasa it's like god knows what's up from here like you're, you're <laughs> doing so fantastically and i it, it is super super important I, I hope i hope that keeps going super well for you and i hope that it does keep expanding and hey hit, hit yeah. me up if, if there's ever anything i like if you ever need any connections down where i am let me know and yeah but, brilliant yeah, on that as well, on that as well, to to just keep thinking. Do you see anything else for you in your career that you'd like to hit with the mathematics? Stepping back into the research and scientist shoes, do you think that you have things on the career bucket list that you'd still try to pursue? Yeah, definitely. There's So there's two sort of main things I would love to do. One of them is to contribute more directly to a space mission so be that a satellite or a rocket launch or anything that I worked I did a bit of I did a summer school at JPL the NASA JPL lab and we worked on designing a mission a planetary mission to Enceladus within our solar system to look for signs of life so this was all conceptual but that whole process of actually designing designing the probe that we're going to send the instruments the science it's going to do it was fascinating so to be able to 
contribute to something like that that you would get to see go to space is definitely something I would love to do better still if I could combine that goal with my other one I would love to just do something to kind of try and combat the climate crisis so if there's you know through space missions I think that's this is a massive area you know we've got so much earth observation capabilities now so many things that can be done from from space and the advantages that we gain from sending satellites and 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 different things into orbit so i think if i could if i worked on a space mission that was combating climate crisis perfect but alongside a space mission trying to do something that's going to improve our future you know and try and tackle this this massive emergency that we're facing in terms of the climate crisis and sustainable living and all all sorts of things like that. So when it's time to move on from NASA, those are the sort of things I'm going to be focusing on trying to move into. Well, I'm damn glad. <laughs> I'm glad you're thinking about like the climate crisis and stuff like that, because from everything I'm hearing, you're the right person for the job. <laughs> gosh, do we, do we need people passionate about it, looking at that and everything? Well, Dr. Rooney, Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. You're a fascinating person to talk to about the story and the ambitions and everything you've done. And it's just so interesting, successful, and so easy to talk to and listen to as well. So I really, really, really appreciate you being on the podcast. And when you're launching rockets, I'll be in contact again. (laughs) Okay, thanks, Andrew. Thanks for having me. This is the end of the podcast. We hope you enjoyed your time If you're feeling generous And you're not completely skinned Why don't you give us some of your money Join our Patreon Join our Patreon Join our Patreon